I think probably a good place for us to start is just laying the foundation of of dopamine and what's happening in our brains. But even before we do that, I have to tell you that when I listened to your book, it was on a car ride, a five-hour car ride with my mom. Uh And I was like, oh, I'm going to listen to this great book. I want you to listen to it with me. And you open with your masturbation machines. Right. (laughs) It started some conversations between us. And by the end, we were in a place of loving the opportunity for us to talk about our own struggles, but also really relating to the people that you bring to the book. So I appreciate all of them for sharing their stories. Oh, well, thank you. Yes. So much gratitude to my patients and their willingness to share their stories in the service of helping others. And there's no doubt that it was a huge risk starting with Jacob's story in fact, I had been advised not to do that, but his story had so many parallels to my own struggles that I just, it, it was the story for me. And I just, it, it seemed dishonest not to open with that, but I've definitely gotten pushback. There's even a review on Amazon, one of the very early reviews that gave me one star out of five that just said, I started reading this book and couldn't continue because of the the sexual content. Um, and you know, that made me sad, <laughs> but um, but I also understand it. I mean, that's fair. And if you stick with it, you start to see that the thread of Jacob's story. So he's a, it's a story about somebody that has a sexual addiction, right. and uh, but you start to see that the thread of what he's experiencing is the experience of many that that's are right. struggling with addiction. And you even mentioned your own addiction, which you bring up in the book as well. Yeah, and the you know this sort of aha moment for me to know that Jacob's story was going to be the the story that would open the book was when I first saw him that very first encounter and he was talking to me and I thought to myself, you know, by then I had um, gotten, let's say past my, my, my personal addiction was I got addicted to romance novels and the Twilight Saga was my gateway drug. And uh, it really did progress, you know, to a point where it was interfering with my life, not anywhere on the order of the kind of life threatening addiction that Jacob was facing. But nonetheless, there were so many parallels. And I remember as he was telling me his story, I thought to myself, you know what? That could have been me. I I could have been Jacob. It did not have this kind of otherness to it, even though there are aspects of his story that are truly shocking and even shocked me, you know, in the moment. I, I more than anything, I just identified with his experience, his process. And I just thought, you know, there before the grace of God go I. So that that's why I wanted to open with it and draw that parallel between my compulsive overconsumption of romance novels and his very serious sex addiction. So I'd love to talk about what is that underlying process, you yeah. know, like like in a neuroscience way, what's happening in our brain, and then also just the process of what it looks like in life when we're caught in an addiction. Yes. So let's start with the neuroscience. You know, to me, one of the fascinating findings in neuroscience in the last 50 to 75 years is that pleasure and pain are co-located in the brain. So that means the same part of the brain that processes pleasure also processes pain, and they work like opposite sides of a balance. And there are three rules governing this balance. The first is that the balance wants to stay level. And our brains will work very hard uh, to restore a level balance with any deviation from neutrality. So let's say in my case, I read uh, you know, some form of escapist fiction, a romance novel that releases dopamine, which is our reward or pleasure neurotransmitter that we make in our brain. We're always firing dopamine at baseline tonic levels. Sometimes those levels go up. That's when we feel pleasure or euphoria. Those levels go down. We feel it's opposite. But basically when I do something or we do something pleasurable, we get that release of dopamine and the balance tips to the side of pleasure. But no sooner has that happened than our brains will adapt to that deviation from neutrality or that increased dopamine in the reward pathway by downregulating our own dopamine receptors and our own dopamine transmission. And I like to imagine that as these little neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again. But the thing about those gremlins is they really like it on the balance, so they don't get off when it's level. They stay on until it's tipped an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. And that's that come down, that after effect, that moment for me when the book ends and I feel a kind of a falling away, or 
an urgency to find another book just like it or very similar so that I can maintain that, that feeling um, that it gave me that sort of escapist kind of feeling into fantasy. Um, now, you know, if we wait long enough, those gremlins hop off and homeostasis is restored. But it's important to fundamentally understand that the way that our brain restores homeostasis with any deviation from neutrality is to tip an equal and opposite amount to whatever the initial stimulus was. So if the initial stimulus was pleasurable, there's a price to pay for that and it's, it's in pain. And sometimes it's very subtle and just outside our conscious awareness, but, but it's there. The second rule governing this balance is that with repeated exposures to the same or similar reinforcing or pleasurable stimulus, that initial response to pleasure gets shorter and weaker, but that after response to pain gets stronger and longer. So one way to imagine that is that now that tiny little cute gremlin that hopped on the first time has turned into an Arnold Schwarzenegger gremlin. And it's like, boom. Or maybe that little gremlin is accompanied by four other gremlins. Because once those gremlins are created for a certain experience, they never go away. They're sort of hiding in the wings and they love to be on the balance. So they're waiting for that opportunity. That means, you know, for the second novel or the 20th or the 100th romance novel I'm reading, it doesn't quite do it for me. But that urge to continue the feeling is even greater because that after response, now I've got 20 gremlins on the balance. And if I continue that behavior over days to weeks to months to years, I end up with enough gremlins to fill this whole room. And now I'm in a dopamine deficit state. And this is essentially the process of becoming addicted. This is what happens in our brains as we become addicted, that our brain, in order to compensate for the enormous flooding of dopamine because of these highly reinforcing and repetitive behaviors or substances, essentially has to chronically downregulate dopamine firing to make up for that. So we're basically walking around with a balance tilted to the side of pain. Those gremlins now have brought their tents and their barbecues and they are camped out there for the long haul. It's not a permanent kind of thing, but it's very, very long lasting because once we've gotten into that, that neurological space, it can take a long time to get back to a level balance. And the way we do that is to abstain. But even when we're abstaining, it can take, if we've been using for weeks to months to years, it can take weeks to months to, in some cases, years actually to restore a level balance. And when you're talking about using, that can be using sort of what we think about in terms of addictive substances, but you've really expanded use to things like romance novels or right. to our smartphones or even to other types of behaviors to escape the, the pain of the present moment. That our definition of addiction has really expanded since when I learned about addiction when I was in graduate school. I remember having a conversation. I studied eating disorders and I remember having a conversation with my advisor about whether or not binge eating or eating was an addiction. And at that time, there was a very hard line right. that said, we do not use the word addiction in here. Right, right. And then meanwhile, I had my own history of an eating disorder. And I had, when I was in my 20s, gone through 12-step programs as part oh, of my recovery. Nice. It wasn't the whole recovery process, yeah. but it was an important part of my recovery. Yes. In the back of my head, I was like, I don't know. I think this is an addiction. I love it. So there is now a huge movement in the world of eating disorders, so that the clinical world of eating disorders, to push for reclassifying, in particular, bulimia to an addictive disorder. Bulimia follows that exact same cycle. Also, the purging releases endorphins as our body tries to compensate for the injury of vomiting. Um, and then you get this flooding of you know, uh, endogenous opioids. You get a kind of a buzz or a high. And that absolutely drives the behavior very, very separate from body image per se, although body image can be a part of it. And the classical definition of eating disorders was always like, well, it's about you know, body image. It's like, no, it's really about this, this compulsive behavior that we use to soothe ourselves, to numb ourselves, to escape, um, you know, to feel better, to change the way we feel in the moment. So you're absolutely right, that's being reclassified. And in general, you know, what I argue in the book is that really everything in the modern world has become drugified. If you think about what makes something reinforcing, really anything that releases dopamine 
has the potential to become addictive. But generally, it's it's not, you know, in like the natural world. First of all, in the natural world, you know, let's say even, even hundreds of years ago, but especially thousands, millions of years ago, we had to work very, very hard for our dopamine. Like it wasn't ready at hand the way it is now. But it also wasn't, you know, as potent. It was just like you had to walk tens of kilometers to find water and to find something to eat. And you were really hungry after that. So you were in this dopamine deficit state because you were hungry and it just sort of restored the balance. Now what we have in food is a great example is we have food that is turned into a drug. It's added sugar, added fat, added salt, added chemical flavors made in a laboratory to create things like French toast ice cream. Because of course, French toast alone and ice cream alone are not enough. So we had to combine them and make French toast ice cream. So food really, like so many things, has become a drug. And now it's releasing a huge amount of dopamine in that reward pathway, which our primitive brains were not evolved to manage, which is precisely why so many of us are struggling with addiction, whether it's you know uh, sex or uh, food or drugs or behaviors like shopping or gambling or video games or social media or just the phone itself, texting. I even had recently, I was teaching some Stanford undergraduates in psychology 101 and afterwards, you know, I had a long line of students come up afterwards and one of them said to me, you know, can you get addicted to a person? And I was like, absolutely. That is easily falls into the category of sex and love addiction. And you can even add sex, love and attachment addiction, you know, which is definitely where I fall. You know, that's my bucket, which brings up the important point of drug of choice. So we're, we're all sort of our pleasure pain balance is going to be tipped different amounts by different things, right? What really tips my pleasure, pain, balance, and side of pleasure may not tip yours and vice versa.